Condemn them after your prayer. Everything is controlled by your love for a Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That man who wasn't too tall or too short or too light or too dark. That man who was fragrant in life and after death. That man who possessed courage and bravery. Who possessed the strength of body, of will, of da'wah, of wealth. His wealth. Although it was not enough for him, it was enough for his ummah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That when he failed to be able to feed people from himself, Allah would feed. And as you were in Medina, as you would have taken the tour with our brother Hasib Noor, he would have told you, "This is the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. This is where the Prophet used to stay, right outside the Green Dome, a few hundred, a few, a few dozen feet away from it. This is where the Prophet's camel sat, and he lived." until his masjid was built and his houses were built. And in that place, there were the moments of love that were expressed for the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, who's an Ansar from Medina, didn't die in Medina and didn't stay and be buried there. He went all the way to where is now Istanbul, that former Constantinople. He was martyred there, died there, waiting to share the truth with other people. The people who loved the Prophet ﷺ were not people who said that it's for me alone. And therefore, when you've come on this journey, you need to be the new Abu Ayyub al-Ansar. You take the words you hear and the experiences you have and you share them abroad. You go back home to whether you're from New York or from Denmark or from Sweden or from Chicago or from Perth and you share the life of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not about the place, but it's about the teaching. What did he come with? And what we said to you on the mountain of Uhud, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Allah said, Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. If he was to die or to be killed, would you turn back or would you remain faithful to the truth? And the truth remains irrespective of the presence of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we're getting closer, we just heard the warning, you know, they breathe into the mic for the Adhan to give the 20-minute warning before the Adhan. In the final moments, I want to reflect upon the final days of the Prophet ﷺ. And in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, <laughs> after performing Hajj, on the day of Tashriq, meaning the day after Arafah, as the Prophet ﷺ had returned to Mina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him, Ida Ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fatih. When the victory of Allah has arrived, the victory that you've been waiting for for 22, 23 years has come to you now, O Muhammad. ﷺ. You've seen it with your own eyes. I've shown you. And the, the ulama, they tell us, shown him a hundred thousand sahaba. And the Prophet said on those days of Hajj, Zawali Allahu al Ard, that Allah, it's as if He collapsed the earth in front of me. And He showed me what is now until it will be, until the end of time. And I saw my Ummah, and I've been made proud of your achievements. And know that I will see you at my pond on the day of judgment. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ The Prophet showed, the, Allah showed the Prophet ﷺ his victory. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ In multitudes we've come to faith. And if you see everyone that's seated around us today, you have the light in skin, the dark. You have the one who's from Africa, the one who's from Asia. You have the one who's from North America, the one who's from Europe. You have the one who's indigenous to Australia. You have everyone with us. There isn't a representation from humanity that is missing in the Haram today. You would fail to find in the Haram today an ethnicity that is not saying La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Fasabbih bihamdi rabbik. What's left for you to do, O Muhammad, than to say Subhanallah? Completion and permanence is only for Allah. The concept of saying Subhanallah, it means that it's the glory is only complete for Allah. It doesn't change with Allah, but changes for all of us. 
And that's why when you look at something, you say, SubhanAllah, look how beautiful this baby is, SubhanAllah. Then you meet them 10 years later and there's no SubhanAllah. It's like, Audhu Billah, what happened to this kid? Teenagers, right? Allahu Akbar. The tasbih, you know, SubhanAllah, it comes from that concept that, you know, masbah, a place you swim, it's an ocean beneath you. You don't know what's in it. It's limitless. Allah's glory is limitless. Subhan, subhana. Fasabbih bihamdi rabbi. So glorify the unendless completion of your Lord. And know that your completion will come to an end. Know that your power is soon to go. Fasabbih bihamdi rabbi. Wastaghfir and ask his pardon. For as well as he lived sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were always things that Allah would correct him with. Little things that Allah would fine tune with him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he's a human being sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was made to be incomplete, for none is complete but Allah azza wa jal. None, except Allah. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا And remind your ummah that it is Allah alone who is the acceptor of the ones who return to him. The moment the Prophet recited that surah, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stood up at the back and he began to cry and he began to weep. And he said, Fidaka Abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah. May my life, may my father, may my mother be the ones who experience this and not you, O Messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr is the only one from the Sahaba who understood, who understood that that verse, those verses were a eulogy of the nearness of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 81 days later, after the Prophet Sallallahu returns to Medina, he begins to feel ill and his body begins to shudder and to overheat. And his head begins to hurt. And as he comes home, Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, I complain وسلم, of a pain in my head. And he said, La, it's my head. Inni la ana ya Aisha. It's my head, the one that's hurting. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he went and visited his wives and he asked permission from them that he be staying in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha. And as he sat with her, for those final 10 days, he would lead the prayers for some of them until finally he was <coughs> unable to stand. And he would come in and out of consciousness. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they ordered that water from all the seven wells of Medina be brought. And they would bathe him in it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they would pour water on him and they would make ruqya for him and recite Quran from him, pass his hand on him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And everyone began to worry about the Prophet ﷺ. The most of them was Abu Bakr, who would not go home for those 10 days until the final day of the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr anhu would sit, those of you who did that tour in Arrauda with me, he would sit in the place of a sirir, the place where the Prophet ﷺ would make i'tikaf. And he would sit there, right outside the house of the Prophet ﷺ, waiting to attend to any need. And none of the Sahaba returned home. They made i'tikaf for those 10 days. No one did anything. And Ali and his Zubair one day, they went in and the Prophet said, I'm well enough to come out to pray. And the Prophet had ordered Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to read prayer, to lead the salah. And Abu Bakr would order Bilal to make adhan at the right time and then would not call the iqamah until the time almost ran out. Hoping, praying that the Prophet would come out. So they call Maghrib and they'd wait until this time. It's almost Isha. And they would say, it's good. we're going to miss it. And when he was finally forced, he had to call. He would say, Aqim salah And he would lead the prayer reluctantly, radiallahu anhu wa arda. And all of a sudden, as he began the prayer of Salatul Fajr, on the dawn of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet summons Ali. Zubair and they bring him out and they seat him in front of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa arda. and the Prophet leads Abu Bakr in prayer and Abu Bakr and the Prophet's voice is too low for everyone to hear it and Abu Bakr makes the announcement as you hear the Imams after the Imam say Sami Allahu liman hamida and so on to notify people of the prayer until finally 
the Prophet ends the prayer and gives final admonition. And he says, and I leave you with these two words of the Prophet ﷺ, that you take back home with you. Because they're the essence of everything we've done. As-salah, as-salah. Your prayers, your prayers. وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ And be careful of everyone under your authority. In particular, your wives, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your prayers, your prayers, and your governance over those who are you are responsible for. The amana that we spoke of in beginning about the Prophet ﷺ is what the Prophet ends his life وسلم, reminding us about. The sada that was given to him وسلم, is the last advice of the Nabi Muhammad ﷺ. And then they took him into his room and he sat in the chest of Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, that my brother Abdul Rahman entered into my into my room to check on the Prophet ﷺ. And with him it was a new toothpick, a siwak. And it hadn't yet been used. And the Prophet was looking to it but unable to ask. So I took it from Abdul Rahman and I chewed it for him and I, and I br brushed his teeth. And it was as if that was a relief to him Wasallam. He had donated all of his wealth. The last seven coins in his home were given in charity. And at that moment, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha, she says, Annahu khuyr, he was given the choice that previously in hadith, he had said that no messenger of Allah passes away without Allah giving them a choice as to the time they would die. When the angel of death came to Musa as is narrated in Sahih Muslim, he punched the angel of death in the eye and broke it. And the angel of death returned to Allah and he said, Ya Rabb, arsaltani ila rajulin la yuridu mawta. You sent me to a man who doesn't want to die. And Allah said, go back to him and tell him to take hair off a cow and to count the number of hairs he could pull off. And for every hair, he'll have a year to live. And Musa asked the angel of death, alayhim salam then what? فَمَا بَعْدَهَا فَقَالَ الْمَوْتِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ It'll be death. He said, فَالْآن Then take me now. If it's death, then it's better to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're given that choice. And Aisha says, I saw the Prophet raise his right hand and point to the sky and say, Rather, I choose the company of the most high, the most praised subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his hand dropped and his body exploded with fragrance. So I said him, and I felt his weight against me. And I yelled out, Mata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's in the embrace of his wife sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From the embrace of one wife, Islam was sent to him, Khadija radiallahu anha, to the embrace of his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, that our deen was complete. And therefore, those words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As-salah, as-salah, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Your prayers, your prayers, and those who are in your charge. Your wife, my dear brothers, your family, my dear sisters, that is what matters the most in our deen. Your prayers and those who you live amongst. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live in happiness and to pass away in the arms of those who are beloved to us and that we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of conditions to be joined with our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وصل اللهم وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا ورسولنا النبي الكريم محمد بن عبد الله عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If I can ask the sisters إن شاء الله before the security come I can see them looking at me from a distance a couple of times to get to the sister side إن شاء الله and to the brothers إن شاء الله we join on the brother side and uh, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow بإذن الله تعالى والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Alright, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi.
وصحبه ومن ولا محمد بن عبد الله عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد في الأولين وصل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد في الآخرين اللهم صل وسلم على رسولنا الكريم محمد بن عبد الله عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم uh, I thought today I would begin with speaking of the man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is the cause of all of us assembling in this place and had it not been for our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, Mecca would still have been known as a backwater, a trading outpost a place in the desert that would be visited only for need or necessity and had it not been for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Mecca, the Arabic people as a whole would probably not have been of any consequence to the world and our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is someone who was chosen by Allah to fulfill a destiny that predated him and that was intended for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the finality of the messengers to humanity. And I want to go back a little bit before our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And there are two prophets in the Quran that are very central to our Prophet Sallallahu message. Whenever you search in the Quran, the two prophets that are given as examples mostly to the Prophet Sallallahu are Ibrahim and Musa. And Ibrahim is that prophet who was given as an early mention to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. The narrations of Ibrahim and Musa, the books that were given to Ibrahim and Musa, were the two examples given to the Prophet ﷺ. Ibrahim in the example of Tawheed. What it means to free yourself from faithfulness to anything, anyone other than the Supreme, the One, the Almighty, the only Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Al-Wahid, Al-Ahad. The One who is singular in His singularity and unique in His uniqueness Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal is One because there is none that can be second to Him. There's none that possesses the attributes, the sifat, the, uh, the, the, the ability and the power that is with him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore we say that Allah is not uh, just wahid, one, which means that there could be another one like the one, but he is ahad. He is one in his unique oneness, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one who was given that message to spread to a people who were hostile to singling out only Allah in worship. And in each and every circumstance that Allah mentions to us in the Quran, or that is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Ibrahim is cast as a person who leads people from darkness into the light of worshiping Allah, of discovering their maker, their creator, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The second example is Musa Alayhi salam and he's the one who struggles to get his people to follow the rules. And therefore Ibrahim is about faith and Musa alayhi salam is about practice. And it is one of those recurring themes in the Quran that is joined in the persona of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu completed in his teaching what it means to be faithful to Allah. The apex and the completion of Tawheed, but also was given the greatest Sharia, the best way of life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in its purity, in its balance, in its moderation, in it fulfilling the necessities that you and I as human beings all desire, all need, all want at some point and at some level. And therefore you see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a normal man. And the people of Quraysh who lived in this region initially, they said, Mali hadha Rasul, who is this man who claims prophethood, claims messengership? He walks in the markets as we walk, and he buys and trades as we buy and trade. He eats, he needs sustenance, he needs to feed himself and clothe himself and has responsibilities and people. What makes him so much more special to us? I have more wealth than him. I have more ownership and land and entitlement than him. Why should he be the one who was chosen to have it? And in fact, they would come testing him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
they would say to him things like, Ashqayta nafsaka ya Muhammad. Abu al-Hakam ibn Hisham, who later we refer to as Abu Jah, the, the keeper and the father of all ignorance, and Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, the wealthiest man of Mecca, they come to Muhammad sallallahu and they say to him, Ashqayta nafsak. This thing, this talent you have, you're using it in the wrong way. You're making your life more difficult rather than easy. If you had come to us, we would have made money with you. We would have set you up to be like our king. We would have used this talent, this thing you say is Quran, to make life easier with you and not to make it difficult. Why are you standing half the night in prayer? Nusfahu aw zid alayhi. Pray half the night. It's a command from Allah to the Prophet ﷺ, unlike us. Awzid alayhi, add to it. And some nights if you're ill or sick, maybe you can lessen. That was our Nabi ﷺ. Why are you doing this? Why are you holding back from usury? Why are you telling people that they have to look after ancestors and others and, and family who are a burden on them? Everyone's his own man. Why should everyone care about others? And Allah reveals the Quran to the Prophet ﷺ, where Allah says Taha, and this is why the name or the two letters Ta and Ha are assumed to be the name of a name of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, there's no narration that says Taha is a name of Muhammad ﷺ. Rather, it's a dialect in the Arabic language of some of the Yemeni tribes where they would shorten big statements into letters. So, so for example, if you were to say Qif, they would say Qalat li Qaf. She said to me Qaf, meaning Qif, stop, right? Or Ta and Ha, it meant Ayyuhar Rajul, O man. It means every man, but in this case, it means the best man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an litashqa. This Qur'an wasn't revealed to make your life difficult. And it was a direct response to these people who were trying to lure him away from his faithfulness to Allah by saying that you've made it more miserable for yourself. We can give you ease if you will follow our way. And the Prophet ﷺ would say to them, if you were to give me the sun in my right and the moon in my left, that I give up calling people to this truth that I'm calling them to, I would never leave it. I'd rather have nothing than have whatever you have to offer, <coughs> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we began our Umrah and we stood on the mountain of Safa, those who were with me, I recounted to them that that was the mountain that the Prophet Sallallahu first declared himself the messenger. And after a number of years, some people say two, some people say three years of the wahi that was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu being reserved for his closest circle, Allah says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Inform those who are near to you in your family, وَأُمَّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا And the people of this city and those who surround it. So the Prophet was commanded to go out and he chose the Mount of Safa. And he stood at its, at its middle, near its top. And he said, يَا Quraysh," And he began to call each of their tribes. O oh, people of this tribe, O oh, people of the... Halummu ilayhi, gather around me. And he says, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum, I'm the messenger of Allah to you. They didn't deny it on account of him being unfit for the job. You know, if I come and say to you, hey, let me do surgery, you have to, you know how you have a problem, you know I'm not a medical doctor. And I say, hey, let me do some surgery. I, you know, I'll take good care of you. You'd be like, hold on a second, you're not fit for that job. You don't have what is necessary to do that. That wasn't what they said to the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't say, hey, hold on, you, we've always known you as a, as a thief. We've always known you as a person who uh, borrows and doesn't return, who's untrustworthy. You're a person whose character is dubious. They never said, claimed anything like that. Your family have always wanted to be kings amongst us. We had to fight them back. Rather, the one who spoke up against him was his own family, Abu Lahab. He saw, he's the one who said, Ajamatana lihada, you brought us all here to say this? Why'd you, do, why'd you do this? You could have talked to us individually. We've been hearing whispers about it, right? And the rejection of him was not because he's not worthy of it. In fact, you know, if we were to consider this a cup of gold <coughs> and you were a person who lived in Mecca and you had gold with you and you wanted a safety deposit box to put it in, 
the person you went to see was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You would come and you say, Ya Rasul, Ya Muhammad, you know, you're the Anta Sadiq Al Amin. You're the one that everyone trusts. So can you keep this? Because at home, I'm afraid my wife will take it. My father, my brother, my sis, anyone else is going to take it. But you, Anta Muhammad, take this. Now, after he came on a Safa and they denied him, the next morning, he knocked on their door. He said, listen, you know, yesterday I came and I spoke to you and you rejected me. You didn't believe me. You made me out to be a liar. And he said that. So obviously you don't trust me with your gold. Here, here's your gold. And they said, no, 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 hold on. Lam fi khabar sama. News coming to you from heaven, we don't believe it. But we trust you on what we have on the earth. Keep my gold. Can you believe these same people who would later murder his Sahaba for believing in him? They would kill Sumayya radiallahu anha. They would kill Yasir, Abu Ammar. They would torture Bilal. These same people who had that, the person who was their safety deposit box was Muhammad sallallahu to the point that when he went to Hijrah, he says to Ali radiallahu anhu who he left behind, when I leave tomorrow morning, you go to this person's house and give this back to them and tell them Qad adda Muhammad amanata. Muhammad has given back his trust. Khalas. 13 years. That's how much they trusted him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even though they opposed him in the matter of faith. And that's quite significant because today one of the last things that we speak of in terms of honesty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, it, we, we speak of it as if it's something, yeah, yeah, honesty, yeah, yeah, trustworthiness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a striking example of honesty. And anyone who was following in his steps was similar to him. And there are people who are alive today, you know, some of our teachers, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, uh, I was, <laughs> you know, some of the Imams that lead in the Masjid, these are things you don't know, right? Some of the Imams that lead in the Masjid, you, you know how busy it gets in Ramadan. So there's no way you're going to be able to bring your car, park it, lead the Taraweeh. You know how the Imams in, you know, in Oklahoma or wherever you come from or America or Perth, you come to the Masjid, you have Imam spot, you leave your car and then you go home, Alhamdulillah. The Imams here, uh, Sheikh Saud al-Shirayim, uh, Hafidhahullah, he came once, led the Taraweeh prayer, left his car in the parking lot, and it was towed away for over parking. Like, can you imagine that? And then they said, okay, this is going to cause a problem. So they began to rent themselves rooms. Now the room here in Ramadan, if you're going to stay 30 days, he's leading the Salah. He's paying from his own pocket. It reached $100,000, 100,000 pounds, 100,000 uh, riyal, excuse me. 100,000 riyal at the end of the month, he paid for the room that he and some of the other shiuch were staying in so that they could lead the prayer here. It, you know, uh, I've had teachers in, 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 in the city of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the most famous who's still alive today, if you were in the haram and you would attend his lessons after Fajr, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him barakah and give his son barakah who was taken after him. Uh, and those who learn from them. One of the stories our teachers tell us about uh, a Sheikh uh, Abdul Muhsin Al Abbad is that you know he was given a car by the university when he got older, where it would pick him up from home and drop him off at the university and take him from the university, Medina University, back home. And the students would tell you that the car, you know, would be traveling down the road. It would stop, and the Sheikh, who's an elder, old man, would get out of the car walk 200 meters in the hot heat of, of the summer, go to a shop, buy some of the things that you would need in the home, and then walk back to the car. And they said, Chef, why didn't you just ask the driver to park near the, you know, the shop? He said, what are you talking about? This car was given to pick me up at home and take me to my office and take me back home. It wasn't given to me to detour and to let me do my personal shopping. The Sheikh used to keep two pens. One pen that the university issued him and one pen that was his own. If you came to the sheikh and you asked him, can I have you know a letter from you or something and it's not university business, he uses his pen. If it's university business, he would use the university pen. This is the amana that was inherited from the Prophet to the Imams of our faith all the way back. 
uh, Abdullah uh, 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 Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Rahmatullah Ali, one of the great Imams of the Tabi'een, he borrowed a pen from someone in Damascus. Damascus. And then by the time he got to Turkmenistan, which is where he was staying at the time, a thousand more miles away, he saw that he had that person's pen. He put back his clothes on and went all the way back. And he said, oh, it's just a pen, Chef. It's not even like, pro it's not even probably expensive. I'm sure he'll forgive him for a pen, but that's not the point. See, we're thinking in a totally different way to our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Our strength as an Ummah is not ever in anything other than in the rudimentaries of what was sent in the akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu in terms of his prophethood. What were the things that made Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so great? That when he spoke, it was truth at all costs. When he promised, he fulfilled it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he advised, it was with sincerity, not for any vested interest. When he traded, he did so ethically, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, Khadija radiallahu anha, when she gave him commerce, she gave him some of the things to trade in Damascus, and he took it there. He's the only merchant out of those who came from Quraysh who sold out. People would come and they would say, how much is this? He would say, I cannot sell this for less than this amount because this is the amount that it's worth. And I'm not, and if you, if you are asked to pay more than this, don't pay because it's too much. People said, SubhanAllah, who's this guy? He's giving you the minimum and he's giving you a range. And if you want to give me up to this, it's fair, but I'll never take more than that. What do people normally do? They'll give you up to that amount because everyone else is trying to, you go to get one of these uh, jubba, and you ask the guy, how much? He goes, 80 riyal. Hey, like, Allahu Akbar. Okay, 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 60. When you turn around to walk away. Type, 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 sanna, 45. Right? What? That wasn't our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sold out everything. Everyone said, don't buy from these people, go to him. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, buy from him. So he sold out. Then he has all this money. What does he do with it? He went and bought more trade. He went and bought new things that aren't in the Mecca in, in Quraysh. He didn't just sell out and say, I've done my job, that's all she asked me to do. He thought of the person who's employed him, who's a mere woman, and he purchased things on her behalf, brought it back to Mecca, sold out again, doubled, tripled, quadrupled her profit. This was your Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. If he was to enter upon us now, you would see a man of average height, a little bit taller than average height. He was lighter in skin color than darker. But you wouldn't say that he was white and you wouldn't say that he was dark. And he was a person who was moderate in all respects. And Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi in his Shama'il, he says from the signs of his Nubuwa that he was middle in everything, in his height, in his complexion, in his word choice, in everything about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had a beautiful, beautiful scent that emitted from him. And the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fragrant throughout his life and especially at his death. Umm Salama radiallahu anha wa ardaha, when she entered upon the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after his death, she put her hand on his chest and she said, Sallaytu Jumu'at. I prayed for many Jumu'ahs thereafter and his scent did not leave my hand. I made wudu after wudu and ghusl after ghusl, I cooked and I cleaned and for Jumu'ahs, for weeks, his beautiful scent had not left my hand Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he entered upon him as he laid there Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, departed, he said to him, Tibta hayyan wa mayyita, you were fragrant in life and ever more so now after death, O Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a person who took great care in his presence. That if someone spoke to him, he would turn completely to them. He would never look over his shoulder to someone and just have a word. And if you spoke to him, whether you were elevated in status or lowly, he would not break his attention from you if someone more influential or someone more urgent came to him. And there's these hadith that sometimes you find astounding. A man comes as the Prophet is speaking and he says, when's the hour? He's not, you know, he's new to Islam. When's the day of judgment coming? And the Prophet doesn't respond to him at all. It doesn't say just wait or say, he just continues addressing the person he was addressing. 
who we know from the hadith wasn't someone who was esteemed as a major personality. And then when he finished, he turns and he says, Aina sa'idu an sa'a? Where's that person who came to ask? And the man had sat and he said, Ana, Ana da ya Rasulullah, it's me, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Ma adatala, what have you prepared to it? That's the question. A woman, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, reports in Sahih Muslim. A woman has something in her mukh, in her brain. She's got a mental illness. Who lived in Medina? Who used to ramble? You know how some people they just talk to themselves and just ramble. And she waited for the Prophet as he's walking. And in the middle of the road, in the middle of the path, as the Prophet is walking, Sallallahu I need to take a word from you. Let's move to the side and take as many words as you want from me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَكَلَّمَهَا مِنَ الظُّهْرِ إِلَى الْعَصْرِ He sat listening to her from dhuhr till asr, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That person who rambles, who you and I would say, oh, okay, 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 uh, I'll see you later. The Prophet Sallallahu who was busier than you and I, who had matters that were more urgent than you and I, that was his akhlaq, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He gave time to everyone, even if he was on his camel and he passed by a group of young children playing, he would pause, get off his camel, وَيُصَاحِفُهُمْ بِيَدِهِ Sallam, And shake each and every one of their hands and ask about him. He's the one who said that if you find that in your heart there isn't mercy, فَالْتَمْسَحْ يَدَكَ عَلَى رَأْسِ يتيم. Put your hand on the head of an orphan. Feel their pain, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's that person who when you would see him, you would see his eyes, they had these dark irises and white, white uh, flesh around them. He had these piercing eyes that from a distance, you would think that he had, you know, beautified his eyes with some kind of makeup or kuh. But his eyes were natural, his brow was natural, his lashes were long and beautiful, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would never look a person in the eye because his eyes had power and you and I would be shy to look him in the face. <coughs> that if you came upon the Prophet Sallallahu and even in your dream, may Allah bless you with the dream of the Prophet Sallallahu you will be shy to look him in the face. And if you were to ask me or others or anyone else, hey, have you seen the Prophet? And you're, hey, yes, what did you see? Wallahi, I saw him, but you can't describe it. It's not something you say, I can describe it. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu wa arda, who lived with the Prophet sallallahu for many years before Islam and many years after Islam. He's known the Prophet sallallahu since before Islam and after Islam. Amr ibn al-As is asked radiallahu anhu, Sif, how did he look? He says, Wallahi, if you were to ask me about the diqqa, the details of his face, I can't describe it to you sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi waqar because he was veiled from us with this majestic awe you can't just keep looking at him وسلم, and when you saw him you loved him there are people in the sunnah that are recorded that the moment they saw the prophet وسلم, they said huwa rasulullah they never knew him before they came to medina searching they hear about a messenger someone saying and as soon as they saw him, they said, Huwa Rasulullah, he has to be the Messenger of Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Without any word, without any advice being given to them. Because of his beauty and his aura, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you would gravitate towards him. Your heart would feel him before your eyes saw him. And the Sahaba, they would say, although we couldn't keep our eyes upon him, that when we saw him, there was nothing that was more beautiful than him. Anas radiallahu anhu, he says, I'd look at the full moon, we're out in the desert. It's a cloudless night. Al-Badr is rising. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You know where the moon just breaks the horizon and it's full, it's covered the whole horizon. That happens in the desert. Sometimes it, it's just majestic, it covers everything. It's like a whole view, view, field of view. And Anas says, as the moon rose, I looked at it and its beauty, and then I turned to say something and I saw his face. فَكَانَ عِنْدِي To me, his beauty exceeded the moon and everything in it. 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was beautiful in his creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was mesmerizing that you would want to look at him, but the awe and the respect endowed upon him prevented it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the same way, his eyes were always guarded. He never looked you in the eye, never looked you, because his eyes were powerful. That if he looked you in the eye, you felt it, he would see into you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that power that was bestowed upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that strength of presence was something that the Sahaba loved about him. And in the authentic hadith, one of the Sahaba, he had prayed as we just prayed with the Prophet وسلم, and he walked out of the masjid and as he's leaving, the Prophet is just about to leave, he ran back and he was in a state of distraught. His eyes are tearing, he's, he's lost control of himself. And he comes to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, Fidaka Abi Ya Rasulullah. May nothing wrong happen to you. I'd rather it be my dad, my father, who's hurt than you. The Prophet said, Mabik, what happened? فقال يا رسول الله نصلي معك We pray with you. وننظر إليك And we love to see you. We love being with you, O Messenger of Allah. And as I was walking home, تذكرت يوم تذكرت يوم I thought of that day where you are going to be in the highest level in Jannah. And if I make it to Jannah, I'm not going to be with you, O Messenger of Allah. I'm not going to be up there. I don't think I'm going to arrive to that height. The Prophet ﷺ said, People are gathered with those they love. فَقَالَ وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي أُحِبُّكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ he said, oh my, oh my Allah, I, I want you to witness, I love you, O Muhammad Sallallahu O Messenger of Allah. You are endeared to my heart. I love you more than anything else. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, أُحْكُمْ مَا تَقُولُ Be careful with what you say. Because loving me is not like loving anyone else. It's conditional. He said, Wallahi inni la uhibbuka ya Rasulullah. Wallahi, I love you, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Idhan, then be ready لسيلن, to a water, a tsunami of, of, of tests that will descend upon you like water cascades off a mountain. You're going to be tested in account of you saying you love me. You're going to have to prove it through your deeds. He said, Wallahi inni la uhibbuk. By Allah, I say it again, I love you, O Messenger of Allah. And at that moment, Allah revealed Quran. And that verse, the Sahaba, they say, لم تنزل على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم آية استبشرنا بها No verse was sent to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that gave us great bushra, great greater God tidings, or greatest joy than this verse. ومن يطع الله والرسول that the one who is obedient to Allah and His Messenger's command فأولئك, for them مع النبيين, I will gather them with the messengers of God, the prophets of Allah والصديقين, and those who accepted the truth والشهداء والصالحين, and the martyrs and the righteous amongst them وحسن أولئك رفيقا, and the best of company they will be in and the Sahaba when they heard that verse they said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Rejoicing that even though my salah is deficient, my siyam is incomplete, my naf, my sunan are not intact, that because I have a love for the Prophet Sallallahu that I seek to prove with coming closer to his tradition, to his sunnah, that you and I, we can attain those highest levels with him Sallallahu That if your heart seeks him and if your deeds model after his way, to the best of your ability with an intention to Allah, that you will be with Him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even if you're separate from in this life, know that He loved you in return for what you will do and what you believe in Him today, having not seen Him. In the authentic hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he was sitting with his Sahaba Yatadhaqar, speaking with them and reminding them, he said, Ahbabi, Ahbabi, and he began to weep. I remind you to, and I remember today, the ones I love, my beloved, my beloved. And he began to cry. فَقَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَوَلَسْنَا أَحْبَابُكَ Aren't we the ones that you love? 
Aren't we them? He said, Antum Ashabi. You are my companions, you are my compatriots, you live with me, you see me, you read from me, you, you study with me. Ahbabi alladheena yu'minuna bi wa lam yarawni. The ones I love, the ones who I've reserved that immense love for, are those who will believe in me having not seen me. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May Allah make our iman an iman that makes us worthy of a tear from the Prophet May Allah make our love for him وسلم, a reason for joining him in the heights of Jannah. <coughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on account of our love for the Prophet وسلم, forgive us the sins that bring down his wrath and separate us from his sunnah and good practice of our deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grow us closer to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the measure of that love is in following and it's in al ittiba it's in taking his counsel and acting in his way and allah says that if we claim love for allah qulin kuntum tuhibbun allah fattabi'uni say if you have love for god if you have a love for allah then follow me sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's not just obey allah fattabi'uni personal follow muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam yuhibbukum allah you will earn allah's love on account of it wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum and of it, he will forgive for you your sins. And that is one of the aims that you and I have in coming on this blessed Umrah, on this blessed voyage, coming together wanting to be with the company of those who have their sins forgiven. Not those, there's none amongst us who's perfect. There's none amongst us who's allowed to be perfect. You will never approach Allah and approach that bayt. No one has approached that Kaaba with perfection. And that's why it's a black stone and not a white stone. And that's why you try to touch it to get your sins forgiven. It's why you touch the Yemeni corner to ask Allah to forgive your sins. Because no one's going to ever approach that Kaaba complete after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore we come to the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with a reverence and a penance and a mention of the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every step you made and every step you will make, you're following his footsteps. You're doing your tawaf from where he began. You're standing on Safa from where he began. You're ending at Marwa from where he asked. You begin your dua with the dua he began. You recite the verses, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, the moment you enter the place he began reciting it. You want to follow in every aspect of it. You uncovered your right arm because he did. You ran in a particular place because he taught. It was nothing of your own doing. None of it is something that you said, this is what I think I should do. Everything was measured from what you wore to what you said.